This is my second time ever doing stand-up comedy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just, you know, felt like with a little experience under my belt, uh, I should be a little bit more professional. And so uh, I'll start by moving the micros microphone stand behind me, which is, I think, uh, something that professional stand-up comedians do. <laughs> uh, I also brought a water bottle out on stage. Um, I don't plan on drinking it. It is purely for the aesthetic value. <laughs> so, uh, when I was a baby, I was asked to be in a diaper commercial. Aww. I probably didn't need to say that that happened when I was a baby, right? Like, you guys could have figured that out on your own. Like, if I had just said I was asked to be in a diaper commercial, no one would have come up to me after the show and been like, when? <laughs> But this is a true story. Uh, when I was a baby, someone approached my mother and essentially asked if I would like to be in a diaper commercial. And she said no, uh, which sucks, because that was probably the only time in my life that I had a chance to be a model. <laughs> um, because like after the age of about six, in order to be a model, you have to be like in shape and fit. But when you're a baby, you just have to be baby shape. <laughs> like, you just have to be a little chubby and breathing, and that's all it takes to get into the commercials. There's no, like, six-pack babies getting into all these diaper commercials. <laughs> yeah, but she said no. But now that I think about it, like, for the guy that approached her to ask if I would be in the diaper commercial, like, how does he describe his job to people? Like, when people ask him what his job is, he's like, oh, my job? Uh, well, I, uh, I go around. <laughs> Looking for babies. <laughs> and when I find a good one, I approach the parents, ask if I can take the baby away from them, <laughs> put it in front of a camera while mostly naked, in exchange for money. <laughs> and I don't know if someone can get used to saying the phrase, it's not child pornography, I promise. <laughs> but if there was such a person, it would be that guy. <laughs> so, uh, one day, one day, I want to assemble a group of 10 dentists and lock them in a room together and ask them a bunch of statistical questions for future analysis. Uh, that way, I can say things like, Three out of ten dentists thought that Shrek 2 was better than Shrek 1. <laughs> Eight out of ten dentists think that the term Black Friday is a little racist. <laughs> ten out of ten dentists think I should unlock the door and stop asking them all these questions. <laughs> so I'm going to say something that uh, a lot of us have probably thought of before, but haven't actually said. Uh, I love handicapped bathrooms. I do. Well, hold on. Let me, let me rephrase that. I don't love the reason why we have handicapped bathrooms. That's not something to be a fan of, the reason why handicapped bathrooms need to be built. Mm. But I do love a bathroom that has that much space. Uh, but now I'm very, I'm very cautious to use handicapped bathrooms anymore because I feel like the time I use a handicapped bathroom is going to be the time that the disabled Vietnam War veteran with the urinary, urinary tract infection is going to be waiting outside, and I don't think I can handle that kind of fear. <laughs> because nothing is scarier than a man who is angry, knows how to kill you, and literally has nothing to lose. <laughs> Though I guess if there was ever a time that I was literally going to have the crap scared out of me, I might as well do it in a place with that much privacy. <laughs> Some of my friends, some of my friends actually actually say that uh, they do their best thinking while sitting on the toilet, which I find really interesting because for me personally, I do some of my best pooping in libraries. <laughs> how, how many of you guys had an imaginary friend growing up? Ooh, you guys were the popular ones, I see. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, imaginary friends were good to have. Like, you know, you play with your real friends at school, and then you, uh, you know, you come home and get to play with your imaginary friend. Well, uh, I had four imaginary friends <laughs> to add on to my very few real friends. And uh, I think one of the reasons I didn't have a lot of real friends is because that I wasn't very creative as a child. And I think creat creativity is pretty important in children. And you can kind of see how uncreative I was just by looking at the names of my imaginary friends, and so I had four. And so the first one, his name was Ani, which isn't such a bad imaginary friend name, it kinda sounds like Ronnie, it makes sense. Uh, friend number two, his name was Vote, as in the word, as in not the name, there is no name, nobody's named Vote. <laughs> uh, friend number three, his name was Lote, which isn't a word and just rhymes with Vote. <laughs> 
And then the fourth one, his name was No. Like, <laughs> like younger me had just given up. Like, I was busy to get to playtime, and his name was, like, you know, something not important at the time. But, you know, I'd play with my imaginary friends all the time, but I kind of felt bad, because No, No was, you know, kind of got lot, left out a lot, and wasn't played with so much. No is the kind of imaginary friend that would have had his own imaginary friends. <laughs> which, lead, which leads me to believe that there's just this endless chain of disregarded imagination in my mind as a kid. And imagine all the things I could have done with that wasted imagination. Have real friends, that's the answer. <laughs> but uh, I've grown up since then, and uh, I have made real friends, which is good. Um, and I found out that real friends give you real things, like uh, presents and illnesses. <laughs> so I got sick earlier in the semester. And yes, that was my transition. Comedy is hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, uh, I got sick earlier in the semester, and uh, the on-campus medical center was closed, so I had to go to the nearest medical center, which was uh, Convenient Care. It's called Convenient Care which right off the bat is not a good name for a medical center. Because like, good names for medical centers are like professional care or reliable care. But convenient care kind of just sounds like they uh, got their doctors on like a first come first serve basis. You know, like eager, but not necessarily qualified care. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I went to convenient care and I did the whole thing where I checked in and uh, you know, I sat down in the waiting room and the waiting room was just me and uh, three middle-aged women and uh, they had taken all the good magazines, so uh, I was forced to let my eyes wander and see what else was available at, in the convenient care. And so, one of the first things I noticed was the slogan of convenient care. And this was the slogan. It was, the center is you. I don't get it either. <laughs> it makes no sense. The center is you. That's not a good slogan. Slogans are supposed to be like little bunches of words that tell you everything you need to know about a company. Like, let's look at uh, Burger King, for example. Burger King, have it your way. Great slogan. Where do I want to go when I want to express my free will? Burger King. <laughs> letting me have it my way. <laughs> Thank you, Burger King, for reminding me how free I am in America. <laughs> Did you see how patriotic I just got there? I got so patriotic from just the slogan. The center is you. Ah, oh, someone got lazy. I felt no patriotism there. Uh, but yeah, the center is you. And when I think about the center is you, all I thought about was a medical center where all the doctors were me. Uh, which is a bad thing, because I am not a trained physician. <laughs> like someone walks into an examination room and I'm just like, Hi, I'm Dr. Nadell. I'm a freshman in college. I play the ukulele and the closest thing I have to a medical education is one semester of ecology. Now, let's try to figure out what type of thermometer this one is. <laughs> Truthfully, I think they made the slogan to distract all the ADHD kids while their parents were filling out paperwork. <laughs> Which I guess works, because even though I don't have ADHD, it distracted me long enough to write this joke. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was the slogan. And uh, I was looking around a little bit more, and I found this little book sitting beside me. And uh, it was this little, maybe 20-page children, children's book. And uh, this was the title of the book. It was, uh, Leo the Little Lion Learns How to Get Ahead of Lead. As in lead poisoning. <laughs> Leo the Little Lion learns how to get ahead of lead poisoning. That was the title of this book. It, it, it's a real book, I promise. It's available for free online. I checked. You guys can look it up too after the show. Leo the Little Lion learns how to get ahead of lead, which features on the cover of the book a lion wearing a long sleeve shirt, rollerblades that say Leo on them, and no pants, which by the way, when I wake up in the morning and I think, hmm, what's the easiest preventative measure I can take against letting, getting lead poisoning today? Wearing pants is really high on that list. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that's what I'm on the cover of the book. And you go into the book and all the pages of the book are like, Leo, what are you doing playing in that construction site? <laughs> Leo, stop eating all those paint chips. <laughs> this is actually, it had a storyline and morals, it was great. <laughs> But it, but it made me wonder, like, why was this made? Like, this book was published in 1994, and I know a lot of people in this audience, including myself, were born at or around that time. Like, was this, was there a need for this? Like, like were parents taking their kids to construction sites, being like, no one told us not to? <laughs> but, the, but the fact that 
this was made, which means that someone had to go to a publishing company and go, I've got a great idea, it features a half-naked lion that teaches, kid ha teaches kids how to not get lead poisoning. And then a publisher had to go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pay you to do that. Which, which still doesn't explain why, why my book, Ger Gerald the Giraffe Learns How to Get Ahead of Gonorrhea, has yet to be published. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.